So just to um, be honest, we'll be muted during this portion. We will be recording the presentation so we can, people can watch it later uh, and we can get access to the slides um, for tonight. I think, uh, and um, that's about it for the logistics. Let me introduce Dr. Scalar. Um, I think most people are familiar with the book he's written on uh, digital communication, which is sort of a very uh, important book that a lot of universities use to teach undergraduates on uh, communications. And um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Scalar has over 60 years of technical experience at various companies, including Aerospace, where I currently work. And uh, since Aerospace, he's started sort of a consulting business and he's continued to teach. And he has, his, 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 uh, over his career, he's published over 100 papers and received paper prizes. Uh, um, and his academic background is uh, BS in math and science from the University of Michigan and MS from electrical engineering from Poly Institute. Brooklyn, New York, and PhD from UCLA. So he's been all over the place, uh, Midwest, East Coast, and West Coast. Um, so I'd uh, like to welcome our speaker for tonight. And uh, Bernie, I think we're ready for you whenever you want to start. Thank you, Victor. Um, it's, it's always an honor uh, to work for the IEEE, uh, basically, uh, I want to mention right on the first page, my email is a pretty simple one, uh, bsklar at IEEE.org. Um, I've already had uh, questions from uh, last week's uh, presentation and I, I invite them. It's the easiest way is because um, at my age, I don't even hear too well, so I don't, I don't necessarily hear the verbal questions, but I could certainly understand them when they're in writing. Uh, we have a lot to continue with on part two, and I think we're going to finish up uh, for tonight uh, in this uh, wonderful technology of OFDM. So um, last time we presented my signature slide, uh, which has appeared ever since August 1983, a plug for my uh, third edition of my book, which I wrote together with Fred Harris. Um, and oh, a couple of the, a few of the things that we mentioned last time, just as a quick review, is some of the characteristics of orthogonal uh, sinusoids. Number one, there must be an integer number of cycles in each subcarrier sinusoid contained in that interval of time, which we're labeling uh, T sub S. That's the data portion of our OFDM uh, symbol. And and two, the relationship between the difference frequency between these. Uh, subcarrier sinusoids uh, is basically the reciprocal of that um, interval of time, uh, T sub S. Bernie, I apologize. When, when Victor shared his stuff, you, you stopped sharing, so you're going to have to go back and share again. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, I apologize. When Victor shared his material, it stopped sharing yours, so you're going to need to go back and, and into the share button and, and share your uh, sh share your presentation again. Yeah, I'm actually looking at a glossary right now. I'm not sure that's who's sharing that, but uh, yeah, Bernie, you're gonna have to share your slides again. I gotta find the share button. It uh, should be on the bottom. Should be at the bottom. Bottom of, yeah, there should be a bar. It says mute, start video, share. Oh, I see it. Share. Okay. And uh, I got to tell them what to share. There we go. PDF. Share this. Okay. Is yep. that sharing it now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, good. All right. Let me just bring this up. All right. Um, here we are. I want to emphasize my email address. Uh, this was our signature, my signature slide. Everybody sort of identifies me uh, with this block diagram and the, the latest one 
being added to it are the OFDM and MIMO blocks. Uh, the first one appeared August of 1983 on the cover of IEEE magazine. My plug for my book that I wrote with Fred Harris, uh, in the third edition, Prentice Hall. And uh, just quick, very quick review of what we uh, talked about uh, uh, last week. And that was the characteristics of the uh, orthogonal sinusoids. There must be an integer number of cycles uh, within uh, the interval of interest, which is our data portion of the OFDM. And the moment you've chosen that interval, uh, this, this formula tells you immediately that for the purposes of orthogonality, then uh, the, the difference in center frequency between those subcarriers has got to be the reciprocal of that uh, uh, time duration. And here are some other orthogonality characteristics that we didn't specify or perhaps mention on the fly. And that is, uh, in order to maintain signal orthogonality, you've got to preserve signal length, preserve constant envelope, uh, you know, as well as in the integer number um, of uh, cycles. Um, uh, notice the cyclic prefix is going to do all of that. Um, uh, by it'll pr help preserve the length, preserve the constant envelope, and uh, and basically we're going to be discarding it uh, right after uh, we, it's received at the receiver, and and it's going to enable us to make linear convolution look like circular convolution. What I think is pure magic. Remember the real test for orthogonality, you know, it is not just the summation of all these characteristics. The, the, the basic test is that the cross correlation in a product, uh, whether you're dealing in the time domain or the frequency domain of the two uh, tones that we're talking about has to equal uh, zero. Um, this is what we went over very carefully, the relationship uh, in time and frequency that gave us a kind of a grid structure. And uh, right over here, we showed a typical um, uh, type of piece of data, a constellation using 16 QAM is what we used as a model. QAM is sort of a natural, but really any any complex plane, Emory PSK, Emory QAM is a natural as the data that is going to uh, uh, modulate uh, this subcarrier uh, and modulate and notice that there's a, a real axis and a quadrature axis. So just by showing this plane uh, to say that the constellation point is going to be modulated, what we mean is the I and the Q or think of it as the amplitude in the phase is going to modify uh, this subcarrier. Um, and so this is the way data um, modulates uh, subcarriers. And notice that the time duration uh, of the signal, which we'll call T sub S, uh, is located right here, uh, is, is the always the interval of time Usually it's the start in a design. We begin with that interval of time, which immediately dictates what this delta F is uh, through our relationships. And looking down uh, in, in through any, um, in, um, the, any interval of time, we see the superposition of all these gated uh, sinusoids. Why do we call them gated sinusoids? Because we're turning them on and turning them off. And so we basically have an, an, a rectangular envelope and, and hence uh, the, uh, the inverse Fourier transform here uh, is a sync function. Um, so as we then went on to show you with a smaller version where n sub c is equal to four, uh, we talked a little bit about my little hang up of calling these potential carriers or candidates uh, uh, carriers, subcarriers, uh, because they can be equal to zero means that they're uh, not really occupied. So our part two really starts right here about the periodic outputs on, um, on a unit circle. Um, so the Fourier transform of a rectangular window gated sinusoid, as you see uh, right here in this picture, uh, is a sync function having equally spaced uh, zeros as you're looking at uh, right over here. 
as when you turn the page and you say, and if the gated sinusoid that we're uh, starting with is discreetly sampled, so we're not taking an analog, uh, we're taking uh, discreetly sampled once it dictates periodicity. Uh, the, Fourier, the discrete Fourier transform or inverse transform of a, um, of a sampled uh, sequence give us, gives us a periodic. It's start, the sync function starts and it's finished and then it starts again and it's finished again and that says, you know, I can nicely show that on a, on a unit circle uh, as long as I get rid of the transients where as long as the start and the finish are exactly the same points and I've got rid of transients, notice how not only is it simple, but it's very convenient to look at something plotted on this unit circle and say, look, I go round and round the circuit and every time I make uh, another uh, path from start to finish, I've basically uh, given you uh, one more period on this periodic uh, type of event. So, um, so also if the spec, if the spectrum is periodic, easily seen on a unit circle, then the transform must have stemmed from discrete samples. So there's a lot going for putting things on a plotting them on a unit circle. And when I ha have the complete OFDM symbol, which is not just the data portion, but also we said a lot about the cyclic prefix, you know, and remember the cyclic prefix is what really houses the discontinuity. We push those discontinuities into the cyclic prefix. Well, uh, we, we can't show this with the cyclic prefix. So the plot that you're looking at here is after the removal of the cyclic prefixes, which is one of the first things that we uh, do with the receiver. So. After discarding this discontinuities carried by the cyclic prefix, what remains is the steady state, no transients. We start, we finish. Every time we go around and around and around, we've gone through uh, one more period. So notice the property of the Fourier transform is that spectral multiplication of continuous signals corresponds to linear convolution. And a property of discrete Fourier transforms is spectral multiplication of sample signals corresponds to circular convolution. Sampling the transform makes the time signal periodic. Sampling the time signal makes the transform periodic. Um, let me just wind up by saying this. Any periodic function on a timeline is nicely portrayed as one copy of the function plotted on a unit circle uh, provided we throw away the transients. And so, and talking about OFDM waveform synthesis and reception, we showed this block diagram uh, last week. We're not going to repeat it. Uh, what we had is a little, uh, some words talking about not really uh, seeing individual time functions out of this inverse uh, DFT, uh, but having uh, a fast Fourier transform going for us. Well, it turns out that I modify those words, and that pertains to last week's words as well. This is the correction or modification where it says it doesn't have to be an FFT. Any uh, inverse Fourier transform will really give us the superposition. That's what the Fourier transform does, the superposition uh, of all of those time waveforms. And if you have M wires in and M wires out, you know, uh, what it means is that uh, uh, well, each of those M wires has the same superposition on it, but each at a different moment in time. Um, baseband OFDM symbols are typically made up of independent data. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, if, if you go back to that uh, uh, grid that I showed you where the data uh, is an I and Q um, showing you that you've got independent ability uh, to put independent data uh, on either side of the uh, zero uh, of the spectrum. And in order to do that, you must have complex modulation. So again, 
complex modulation. You can't see complex modulation here. You have to infer it from the fact that there's a real axis and an imaginary axis. So every time you come out with modulating a constellation point, and I've showed you that point here in red, um, uh, you're, you're going to have an I and a Q, or uh, a phase and an amplitude, and that's going to allow us to do independent data. And um, notice that modulation with such complex signals is not unique to OFDM. The transform of any real baseband signal has Hermitian symmetry properties, which we're going to show you in just a moment. Uh, but a complex signal does not. Having I and Q cosine and sine channel allows for single sideband separation. That's one way we get to put anything we want uh, on either side of this. Uh, so keep in mind, again, that's one of the privileges we have with OFDM. We don't, we don't have around zero frequency uh, uh, a, a basically uh, an identical, a mirror image of what you have here. That's what would happen if you were at a real signal. So let's describe uh, what we call uh, Hermitian symmetry, real and imaginary uh, signals and Hermitian uh, symmetry. If you have a real time signal, it has a complex spectrum. Its spectrum is an A plus JB term. It has got a J portion, a real and an imaginary term. Similarly, if you had uh, an, um, an imaginary uh, time signal, in other words, if this, uh, 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 what you see here in this sketch was just flipped down onto the imaginary uh, plane, well, you'd have something very similar with even an odd symmetry, but it would be flipped on this frequency axis. So let's give you the, the heart of it. Um, for a real signal, a real signal has even symmetry uh, on the real axis of, the, of its spectrum and odd symmetry uh, on the imaginary axis. Remember, a real signal is one, let's say, that's just the cosine alone, and you um, take its Fourier transform, and immediately you get a complex spectrum. This is the nature of a, a complex spectrum. It has uh, uh, symmetry. There's, there's a match, uh, even and odd, uh, even on the real axis, odd on the imaginary axis. And if you, again, had an imaginary signal, not a complex signal, just a time signal, maybe a sine wave uh, that was, had a J in front of it, but no real part. Uh, then again, when you get its spectrum, it of course it is complex. And notice uh, that for an imaginary signal, uh, the, the spectrum is uh, even symmetry on the imaginary axis and odd symmetry on the real axis. So, what if you have a complex signal that you have, uh, such as a cosine plus a J sine? Uh, uh, here's the, the uh, even and odd symmetry associated with uh, a real signal. Uh, here's a even and odd symmetry associated with the imagined. If you added these together, what do you get? You get a spectrum, a complex spectrum, but no symmetry at all. The moment you get no symmetry at all, you know that this uh, waveform, the, the, the waveform that have, has given forth this kind of a non-symmetrical uh, Hermitian, non-Hermitian non, uh, spectrum uh, of that complex signal. It must, it must have stemmed from a complex time signal. It must have had an A plus J, JB portion. So from this sketch, one should see that independent signaling across F0 is achieved by just choosing the proper values of A plus JB or their spectra that has, uh, you know, this kind of a uh, non-Hermitian uh, spectrum. So um, notice that this kind of a spectrum has um, no symmetry at all around zero. So it takes two wires uh, to 
describe a, a signal like this, but notice how if I upshifted this onto a carry wave, notice how you would have um, you would have perfect symmetry of a real signal around zero. Again, that means you can send it off one antenna because now it's a real signal, but around uh, each of the uh, uh, positive and negative uh, uh, spectral uh, uh, points, you have um, no, no symmetry. Okay, so th that's the point we're emphasizing here. What we want is independent uh, data in OFDM. Remember, remember what we're doing. Our primary job in OFDM is to manipulate orthogonal sinusoids over uh, bands of frequency and slots of time and in the most, um, uh, in, in the easiest way that you can see. And the easiest way is, uh, first of all, to make, you've got to maintain orthogonality throughout and you've got to have the ability, because this is complex data, uh, to, to put independent data uh, on this side or this side. Um, okay, so let's look at our wish list. What do I mean by a wish list? Um, I've come up with something and I just finished it today and I'm, I'm pretty proud of it because I think of this piece of paper here uh, as uh, it's called an OFDM glossary, but it's more than a glossary, uh, it's a tool. Uh, this is the sort of thing I would laminate for my wallet. This is the sort of thing that would be my cheat sheet that I wouldn't want to live without if I were in the business of designing uh, OFDM uh, systems. Because remember that an OFDM system has lots of uh, blocks to it. You remember from uh, last week how we went over uh, so many of those uh, features blocks. There was a I called it a multifaceted uh, type of technology. And, but notice how the moment you start making a design in these blocks, um, you typically start with choosing a, a signal, a symbol time, uh, T sub S uh, is the symbol time. And, and that T sub S, of course, dictates a delta sub F and so on. So notice what this tool does for you. It comes up and under the headings of numbers, which are all the various counting mechanisms that you have uh, in this technology, um, subcarriers, uh, transform size, uh, cyclic prefix samples, uh, total samples within an OFDM symbol, uh, a, a very typical kind of apportionment of how many, uh, uh, what percentage of subcarriers are typically uh, make up the, uh, for the percentage of the transform size. Uh, and in time, you got all these variations, uh, the uh, symbol time, uh, the cyclic prefix time, the OFDM time, and all the way uh, that they can be configured and the time in terms of the n sub L total uh, samples multiplied by the time of one of these samples and so forth. And so notice what you've got. You got a vehicle here uh, that can be a really a viable check on does every every way that you can possibly look at all these uh, little relationships uh, by the counting numbers, by their times, by their rates or frequencies or bandwidth, that you can relate this design. So once you get embedded in the, into this design, do you see, see that this page is a tool? This tool is for you to do your final checklist. Does every one of these numbers really check out? The, does every relationship uh, as, as counting numbers or time numbers or, or frequency numbers check out? And, and what is added to this tool is not only do you have to live up to a particular design where you might be given some of these things, but you have to uh, find the others yourself, but you have to live with a certain uh, channel parameters and these are the ones that were given to us, remember, by Bob Price and, and, um, and um, uh, uh, 
Bob Price and uh, what's his name? Uh, forget. Uh, in that, about 1963. Uh, okay, so I'm telling you that that's coming on an upcoming page. So why OFDM? Remember what we need to do. Uh, the WUSIS model that we went over uh, last week uh, tells us about uh, a channel coherence bandwidth. Uh, that is the, the region that gives us reliability, consistency. That's where the behavior of, of the uh, parameters of our signal, if they fall within uh, this coherence bandwidth, uh, will uh, behave in a similar fashion, uh, consistent or reliable. Uh, so here's our uh, wideband signal. That's the way we usually go into an OFDM. We have a, that's where it's most useful is for wideband applications. Oftentimes to take a uh, photo uh, or artwork and to, uh, and to uh, subdivide it uh, into smaller bands, smaller bands. So we, we mitigate, how do we mitigate when we have a bandwidth that exceeds uh, the F sub zero? Uh, uh, coherent bandwidth and therefore uh, is is uh, privy to becoming uh, frequency selective fading, um, which is, you know, terrain dependent, etc. Uh, we immediately uh, mitigate, which in this case means partitioning, and we come up with a, a, a certain little wish list that we have here. So we gave you this wish list yesterday, and let me remind you uh, that uh, first of all, uh, remember that in general, we're telling you about the relationship between our uh, symbol rate uh, and we want to be well within the coherence bandwidth. So F sub zero should be greater uh, to preclude the frequency selective fading, but also um, we can't be, we can't go too fast because there is this fading rate or the Doppler spreading um, where it's a channel effect, but again, it depends upon motion. It may not be our motion, it may not be our mobile, uh, it may be the atmosphere's motion, but something's moving in that channel. So uh, this is the general formulation. And remember uh, wh why we've changed for OFDM, excuse me, let's look back what, what we did here, because remember in OFDM, this mitigation has changed the bandwidth, this is the modulating bandwidth, no transitions on this bandwidth, modulating bandwidth divi divided by essentially how many subcarriers are there uh, in there. So that's how it's changed for OFDM. So remember that whatever form you're seeing this wish list in, this is the region, this, this in inequality is precluding frequency selective fading, this one precludes uh, fast uh, fading. So let's take an example of how uh, large uh, should N sub C uh, be. Uh, so look at what I do. Uh, we're going we're gonna to test a little example. So remember where I got this from. I got this from our wish list um, in the case that we were dealing with OFDM. Uh, and in order to get to the point where I can convert it into something useful for making decisions about uh, the uh, the range of n sub c, uh, first of all, I take the reciprocal of all these terms here. And the moment I take the reciprocal, uh, you, you know what happens to these inequalities. They uh, get inverted. Uh, greater than becomes less than in both cases. And then uh, to get n sub c by itself, I multiply both, uh, I multiply all three terms by the signal bandwidth. And lo and behold, you see what I've got now. I've got something where the left side inequality is going to allow the computation for the minimum in the figuring the range of, of subcarriers. And, and knowing that I, uh, listen, I don't want to uh, go too fast either. So uh, this uh, inequality gives me the uh, computation for the maximum uh, N sub C. Uh, so here's my little example. Um, I give you an example where the wireless channel has an RMS delay spread, you know, now this comes uh, from the channel. It's, it's given, it's the nature of what the channel has nothing to do with your signal or with your OFDM design. It's the nature of what they uh, uh, 
uh, Bob Price came up with in 1963. So, and I, I also give you a coherence time of 50 microseconds, 50 microseconds. That, that doesn't even look kosher to me because that's a very fast uh, coherence time. Um, but uh, let's, let's in fact uh, take a look at what happens when I uh, uh, solve this problem. And I, I'm using that uh, coherence bandwidth uh, that was given to you with this 50% uh, approximation indication for which we developed this relationship uh, yesterday. I'm sorry, last week. <laughs> One divided by five times uh, the sigma sub tall was given. Uh, that gives us a, a, a coherence bandwidth of 40 kilohertz. Okay. Um, uh, if I want n sub c, the minimum is five, I got to have at least uh, 500 uh, subcarriers, or um, to make this right hand inequality to figure out n c max, it's 1,000. So the range is 500 to 1,000. But to emphasize a point that there was one parameter here, and that's this 50 uh, microseconds of t sub zero, which is not realistic. That's the one. Well, I'm going to skip this for a moment because you've seen this, but it's it's getting in our way here. So notice the parameter, 50 microseconds, is not realistic because um, if I assume a carrier frequency of say 300 megahertz, um, and T sub zero is equal to 0.5 uh, of, uh, times the wavelength divided by velocity, uh, I, I can solve, for, I've got everything, but I can solve for velocity, that's ridiculous. That says that uh, uh, I've got uh, a vehicle uh, that's moving at, uh, or something's moving at 22,369 uh, miles an hour. That's, uh, that's a rocket ship. Now, uh, so before I go any further, where did this come from? Where did uh, this value of T sub zero uh, come from? Um, and I think it's worth reading this because it's important. Coherence time, which remember came to us as channel information, like it has nothing whatsoever to do, you would think, with the user. But it does, in a way, have something to do uh, with the user because in a multipath channel, the same waveform received by two antennas that are displayed by about a half wavelength are statistically uncorrelated. In other words, after a mobile system traverses a distance of a half wavelength, it will typically experience a changed fading profile and the time T sub zero that it takes to traverse this half wavelength distance is referred to as the channel coherence time. So this 0.5 of a wavelength, which you see why 0.5 of a wavelength, um, because that's where consistency uh, is finished, uh, divided by the velocity, uh, you know, is uh, meters per, uh, uh, this is meters, uh, this is uh, meters per second. So meters over meters per second is second. And this coherence time is the duration for which the channel's impulse response is reliable. Now, on the one hand, you know, we thought like uh, T sub M and F uh, sub zero and T sub zero and F sub D were all channel parameters given to us. I remember the name now, Paul Green, Paul Green and Bob Price in about 1963. And you think uh, there, it all has to do with the channel. Well, look, the, the channel has something to do with movement. On, remember, on the right-hand side of all those channel terms, uh, we had a fading profile. But the left-hand side had the rate at which that profile was moving. So there was something moving. And that something could be a moving vehicle or at least uh, perhaps an atmosphere or something is moving. So we got to trick the channel and we've been through this. This was our tool and this was the best slide we had to show you uh, last week. How by using that cyclic prefix, by moving that back end where we had 
you know, a continuous edge right here. We move the uh, discontinuities to over here. That was a magical tool. And in fact, uh, an example of tricking the channel, converting linear uh, to uh, circular convolution. And I want to show you an example. Many of these things we covered last week, but I want to show you an example that we didn't cover uh, last week. So here is a, uh, a piece of uh, sampled data uh, that it is at these five instants of time from zero uh, to four, uh, you're uh, putting out a sequence that's an amplitude one, two, three, two, one. And you are transmitting it over a channel that it has an impulse response that has this kind of an exponential uh, shape to it, three, two, one. And uh, to do linear convolution, we simply invert one of these. Uh, let's say we're going to invert this one. So the inverted impulse response becomes one, two, three. And we're going to shift it past and do this product integration or product summation that is one times three is three. Then, then there's a shift, another multiply, two times three is six plus one times two uh, adds six and two is eight and so forth. And when you finish, here's, this, here's what you get. You get the sequence three, eight, 14, 14, 10, four and one. The first thing to notice is that the original five data samples have grown to seven. So re remember the characteristics of orthogonality. If you go through this impulse response and you keep the transients there, you're no longer orthogonal. Uh, you've just lost orthogonality. Um, so you ask the question, what would circular convolution look like? Um, so, okay, here was H, H of K, here is H of uh, rever the reverse h of k, h of minus k, and I'm just repeating it here. And what I'm going to show you here uh, is a way for me uh, to do a circular uh, convolution uh, where there is no transient. And and the way I'm going to and and there is no growth of the signal here. So it, it's a it's a real kind of a a trick to do circular convolution with these samples. And so notice I got a circularized time index K uh, where uh, the, on the outer circle uh, are the going counterclockwise. I go through the positive bins of time, zero, one, two, three, four. And on the inner circle going clockwise, uh, I go uh, zero minus one, minus two, minus three, uh, minus four. And so uh, if you then say, uh, let's, um, uh, let's take uh, these uh, uh, reversed uh, impulse, uh, impulse response and uh, do the following, uh, make it causal uh, in the sense that I'm going to take what is minus one and minus two. Uh, and with this circle in mind, um, minus the minus one bin uh, is the same as the plus four bin well, and the, min and the minus two bin is the same as the plus three bin. So minus one, uh, with, which has got this amplitude two, uh, can be moved uh, to position uh, four, uh, as this indicates, and minus two can be moved to position three. So having done that, notice what I then have. So here's the same sample data that I had done linear convolution with before. And now I'm lining it up uh, with this um, made causal uh, the sequence that is amplitude three, zero, zero, amplitude one, amplitude two. And, and notice what I'm about to do. I'm basically going to do, um, uh, I'm going to do product summation. One times two is two plus three is seven. Um, is it, uh, I'm sorry, two, uh, one times two is two, plus two times one is two is four, zero, zero, and plus three is seven, and so on. Then I do an end around shift, and I do it again, an end around shift, I do it again, end around shift, end around shift, 
And notice when I make the next end around shift, I'm right back there at the beginning. So I am, I have really done circular uh, convolution. There is no transient involved. The, the, the finish over here is the same as the start over here. And so this is what I get. I get uh, the sequence uh, 7, 9, 14, 14, uh, 10. Now, here's what to keep in mind. How can I make the channel's linear convolution look like circular convolution? We need a trick with a cyclic prefix that's long, and, and I, I want that cyclic prefix to be meaningful, so it has to be longer than the channel uh, delay spread, typically the RMS channel delay spread, making the signal look periodic. So uh, we need a trick because why do we need a trick? You know, uh, because there is no mechanism in nature that yields circular convolution. Really? There's nothing in nature? Why not? Well, uh, my answer to begin with is a little literary. From Rudyard Kipling, I quote, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Uh, and you know, what, you know what I'm saying in a liter, literary way? Think of what you're doing when you send, when you launch a signal. Launch it, it's gone, poof, it's out there. And I'm saying, oh, I want you to grab it, grab it back again and tie it back to the beginning and without any transient, and that's how you're gonna have circular convolution. Grab it back again, it's gone. Uh, you know, um, it's not possible. So there is nothing in nature that ever can give you circuit. You're hoping you can only get linear convolution in, in nature. And and what we've done is we've made that cyclic prefix do the work of remember how we said it's going to move our discontinuities for us. And indeed, when we finish up, remember why we're doing this. We're doing this to help preserve orthogonality. Well, this is this is the circular convolution that we did when we had. We, we did it as a pure artifact of making the signal causal and, and putting it around in a circle, and there was no uh, um, uh, 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 transients. And notice, now that I've done linear convolution, uh, suddenly uh, what I've got is a portion that's going to be removed by the receiver. That's the first thing the receiver is going to do. Is going to, here's where it does it. Here's that blocked diagram. As, as this comes off the channel, serial to parallel, it takes out the, the portion that is the cyclic prefix. And, and once that cyclic prefix has been removed, what have you got left? Uh, you got the part in the middle uh, is exactly the part in the middle here. So after the cyclic prefix has been removed, I have indeed uh, got tricked it into uh, doing circular uh, convolution. That's why we move the discontinuities to the cyclic prefix in the first place. If you remember last week, uh, we focused on this slide a lot and we said, see, we moved the discontinuities that used to be out front here, it's now uh, uh, in front of this. So removing the cyclic prefix at the receiver means that we've removed the, the discontinuities. Okay, so the OFDM applications, um, uh, according to these standards, and again, I told you that this is that, uh, uh, and, and by the way, I, get, I just got finished with this today. Uh, it wasn't available before that because, and I, and I came to realize how important this is. This is a tool. This is something that I would really like to laminate for my wallet uh, because every time I had a, um, uh, an OFDM example, and, and notice why I have to add the channel parameters because in 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 the in in figuring out to make sure all of my relationships, my counting uh, numbers, uh, my time numbers, my frequency numbers are correct in OFDM, I also have the job of living up, living within the certain 
uh, channel parameters that must have been given in this problem or uh, certainly have to I have to assume some kind of a channel. So that has to make up part of this uh, little tool. I, again, you see the importance of this. I'm going to grab this tool out anytime I want to examine uh, any of the details uh, of, um, uh, of a channel. Uh, and, and so any of the details of an OFDM system that's, that's living within certain channel constraints. So here is a particular application. It's 802.11a, and notice what they, here are the numbers they've chosen. For T sub S, they have chosen 3.2 microseconds, and the cyclic prefix uh, is 0.8 microseconds. And by the way, I said that uh, um, uh, a typical uh, size for the cyclic prefix uh, is 25% of the uh, T sub S, and this in fact is 25% of the T sub S, and the uh, TOF, T, uh, the time for the entire OFD, OFDM, you know, um, includes the cyclic prefix. So it's T sub S plus T sub P, which of course is four microseconds. Now, um, in 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 this particular case, I got I got to know a little bit more. Um, about the application, like for instance, um, the moment, um, the moment you know that I have chosen a time t sub s, immediately I've chosen a delta f. That is part of my uh, little block diagram tool that I must remember, and and that means uh, that, uh, and in fact, it is the reciprocal of. T sub S, one over T sub S is 312 and a half uh, kilohertz uh, between the FFT bins. And if you take a look at uh, what is the number of uh, uh, data tones, um, that's N sub C in this case, uh, uh, plus in K, uh, I got to count in the pilot tones as well. So there are 52 subcarrier tones here too. What is the total? transmission bandwidth, that means, uh, I don't mean the transmission bandwidth, I mean the modulation bandwidth, because the transmission bandwidth is always going to have some extra skirts, namely transitional uh, skirts. But this is just the modulation bandwidth, which is essentially, oftentimes it's said to be approximately N sub C uh, times um, uh, 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 delta F. but uh, to count the edges, uh, uh, kind of a, a little half extra at each edge, it's usually given as N sub C plus one sub delta F. And this is where you get 16.6 uh, uh, megahertz as being uh, the, uh, uh, the channel uh, size uh, in total bandwidth. That means all of the subcarriers have to fit in here, and there are 52 subcarriers. In a sense, you know, uh, this divided by 52 is essentially uh, is essentially 312 and a half, or it's essentially the bandwidth of one of the subcarriers. Um, so the channel spacing in this case, and that channel spacing does have uh, guard bands, uh, and those guard bands are going to be a function of of somebody who's knowledgeable about the adjacent channel uh, 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 information, uh, uh, interference, I'm sorry, adjacent channel interference. And in this case, uh, four uh, megahertz uh, to uh, on either side have been chosen. And, and so you got uh, 20 megahertz from center to center of the channel. This is what a, a block of eight channels uh, would look like. And uh, uh, again, I'm just naming uh, some of these OFDM parameters for 802.11. Uh, and by the way, notice how many, in, in this many faceted technology, where, you know, on our, what I said was my uh, uh, little wallet uh, um, 
tool I'm going to put away, I got all these uh, parameters. And, and notice how many ways I can say something. For instance, uh, uh, the, the sample, the sample rate. The sample rate is just samples per second. Samples per second as if I, if I know the, the total time of any one sample, then the reciprocal of that gives me the sample rate. If I know the total number of samples in an OFDM uh, divided by the time, that is samples per second. If I, again, no matter where in this configuration of, uh, of uh, technology I'm looking, if I'm looking only at the CPs, you know, when I'm, when I'm taking samples, I'm, I'm not taking samples at different rates. There's a, just a given sample rate. So wherever I'm looking at, if I'm looking at the CP, I can get uh, this divided by this gives me the same sample rate. The total transform uh, divided by uh, the, uh, the total transform size, um, which is, you remember, uh, in this case, it's going to be that's 64 or 128. Uh, is my, uh, you know, IDFT or DFT uh, size is uh, divided by the size of T sub S. And so any one of these, uh, it gives me the same uh, samples per second. So, okay. So if I, if I increase them, notice I, I take a, a typical N, NCP is equal to 25 percent of, of the transform size. Notice if sample if the sampling rate goes up, if I want the sampling rate to go up, um, it'll give me higher time resolution. It'll in, it'll give me an increased sample rate. Uh, it'll give me bigger spacing between uh, the replicate copies. Uh, of of the uh, um, of the spectrum, and that gives me easier analog filtering. Um, but notice that it doesn't change the bandwidth, because uh, remember I am not sending samples; I'm sending waveforms. So uh, it gives me a lot of things in the way of resolution and and making filters easier to build. And that's important because it makes the cost uh, smaller to go to a higher sampling rate, but it doesn't change uh, the, the bandwidth. Um, I think I said, I just said that. Let me skip this. Okay, so there are also nice, this is just repetition of looking at the same 802.11 by uh, showing now N sub P and N and sample rate in time. But notice that it's just a pictorial where I'm drawing uh, together with the uh, grid of the, uh, of the uh, uh, free, you know, subcarriers and, and uh, uh, time, uh, just to show you what you'll sometimes see. Now let's do a little exercise. In this 802.11 OFDM exercise, consider the system having the following parameters. Say the 64-point uh, transform. I've just given you n, n equals 64. 48 message occupied bins. I've, I've just given you n sub c. Uh, OFDM symbol time is four microseconds. Um, I, I basically gave you one of the features of 802.11, that is all, it's, it's symbol time, OFDM symbol time. The CP time, you know this also, I'm giving it to you eight tenths of a microsecond. And the data modulation is 16 quam. So this is now not the spec. Uh, this is not 802.11. This is a particular piece of data, and this is a particular code. I say, find the sampling rate, find the sampling time, Find the code bits per subcarrier, code bits per OFDM symbol, data bits per OFDM symbol, data rate. And if the channel maximum delay spread is 20 samples, determine if the given CP time of 8 tenths of a microsecond 
is really long enough to mitigate the channel uh, intersymbol interference. Remember, uh, there's, there's it's, it's for, for finding about the CP, it's not just 25%, that's the convenience of the uh, transform, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the transform size. Uh, it's, it's got to be big enough to, ha to look at what the, uh, is happening to the channel parameters uh, that you're uh, given. So, okay, so uh, you, you get the tone spacing by taking simply the reciprocal of T sub, T sub S, and you given here the TO of DM and take away the cyclic prefix is one over 3.2 microseconds is in fact uh, delta F, uh, which we told you, T, you start with a time, you get this. So now the sampling rate, uh, again, you can get the sampling rate in lots of ways. You just take the, the transform times delta F, that is the sampling rate, it's 20 megahertz. What about the, uh, the sampling time? Well, it's a reciprocal of the sampling rate. So every sample now has a time of 50 nanoseconds in this system. Now you're using, I told you to use 16 QAM. 16 QAM yields four code bits per subcarrier. Remember, this is gonna be complex, but there are four code bits here. And there are 48 message occupied subcarriers per OFDM symbol. So, and remember, they're encoded with a code. So 48, uh, four code bits multiplied by 48 of them are, you know, N sub C subcarriers. So I got 192 code bits per uh, OFDM symbol. Now there's a rate three quarter uh, code. Uh, and so by multiplying this 192, I can get the, the data bits per OFDM symbol. And uh, if I want the data rate, I just uh, take the, the data bits over the symbol divided by the symbol time. Well, the symbol time, you know, is the OFDM time, uh, which uh, this was four microseconds, uh, and that gives us 36 megabits per second. And the last said, uh, well, the maximum delay spread, I wanted you to find out if, uh, if our uh, little cyclic prefix Remember what that cyclic prefix was given to you as uh, it was given to you. It, it's, uh, it's, it's eight tenths of a microsecond is that little cyclic prefix. And you want to know if that's good enough uh, for what it's, uh, it's got to do on the job of taking care of what the spread is like, likely to be uh, uh, in the environment, in the channel. So I told you on a given that the 20 samples on um, uh, and and you know now the time of a, a sample is 50 nanoseconds. So lo and behold, uh, the maximum delay spread is one microsecond. And if you want that cyclic prefix to be greater than, uh, um, I, I, I think the cyclic prefix, I think this is kind of, I have to double check this. I, I believe that the nature of the cyclic prefix is that its time should be greater than the RMS delay spread, and I'm giving it to you in terms of the maximum. Uh, but nevertheless, if it was in terms of the maximum, uh, it wouldn't be good enough because it's only eight tenths of a microsecond and it would have to be longer. Let, let's take an example of taking a long message sequence like data and, and remember how picture data or any wideband data is perfect for an OFDM uh, kind of a configuration uh, to handle it. So let's say you had an 84-bit sequence, and here it is. I just made this up out of, out of thin air, uh, this 84-bit sequence, and I suddenly said, I'm going to handle it with this kind of symbols, 16 ARI quam. So given that there's 16 ARI quam, and I'm, and I'm sending it, I said, show this as 21 symbols sent over three OFDM symbols. So I just take four bits at a time, four bits, four bits, four bits. I take seven of them, and that's uh, basically 21 uh, QAM symbols 
is data symbol number one, uh, OFDM and data symbol number one. Uh, the next uh, 21 is data symbol number two, and the next uh, 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 21 uh, bits uh, are uh, data symbol number three. So let's let's see what I do. I'm going to show the locations of these four data bit sequence on this 2D constellation because remember when you have a, a QAM constellation that is gray coded uh, and you remember why it's gray coded. It's gray coded so that if you make any kind of an error and you choose uh, a, a symbol, uh, you know that errors are going to be made more frequently in nearest neighbors than they are uh, uh, this guy compared to this guy. So you want all of the bit sequences uh, to change their bits in just one position for nearest neighbor type. That means a vertical uh, change or a horizontal change. And if you check them out, these bits are gray coded and that's how the constellation sits. And they represent symbol zero. This is symbol four, because that's what they spell out. The number four, this spells out the, uh, these binary digits spell out the symbol 12. This is symbol eight and so on. So notice when I say spell out, it means from the center, I can draw a, think of it as a in, you know, in phase quadrature, a, an I and a Q or an X and a Y, but my message symbols are gonna be uh, what I'm calling them here. Uh, I'm sending out, um, this is symbol zero, symbol four, uh, symbol is symbol nine. So the sequence is you send out, remember what I asked for, send out nine, four, one, 14. I'm taking the first data symbol here and I'm saying that's the message, nine, four, one, 14. And those are the phasors you're gonna be sending out. So do you see what you're doing? You're gonna be, this, these are the message symbols which are going to be partitioned onto these subcarriers of this grid that we've been uh, working with. And so notice what you got, have over here. You have a phasor, uh, which is uh, symbol number nine. Uh, you have a, a phasor, you have an I, uh, an X and a Y, or an A plus JB, which is symbol number four, symbol number one, 14, and so forth. <laughs> Now, OFDM is particularly useful for high data rates like picture data. And uh, I, you're going to have these slides. So I'm going to, you know the old saying that a picture is worth a thousand uh, words. And certainly uh, that's an age old expression, which is true in the behavioral sense. But what about uh, the task of saying, is it really worth a thousand words when you're talking about comparing it to making these transmissions of, of, of bits and symbols and having bandwidth and, and data words of these transition? Is it worth a thousand words? Well, let's take a particular picture, which is an eight by N, high quality, a uh, lot of pixels, uh, three, three a high quality photo three megapixels. Uh, I'll let you do this your, yourself. Its, its solution is pretty simple. It comes out to be two million words. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I, won't, I'll, I won't do it here. And for maintaining orthogonality among the subcarriers in OFDM, the tone spacing was chosen to be one over two T sub S. Now I can ask you that question. Why wasn't it chosen to be one over TOFDM? Why was it chosen to be uh, uh, T sub S? See, no, 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 let me point out that I have a, a, a data length here, T. Once I've got this T, notice that um, when I take a look at the Fourier transform uh, of this uh, T, I get a, a sync function. Uh, where the, the, from the peak to the first uh, zero crossing is one over T. And when I stack them up, you know, with a 50% overlay, a factor two improvement 
in bandwidth efficiency, which of course is is not really the reason why we're ever going to be using OFDM for this reason. But you see that, and uh, so we and with the proper pulse spacing of uh, one over t, well, the sequence is orthogonal, uh, just characterized by the fact that this peak uh, corresponds uh, to the uh, uh, zero uh, that you see uh, on this uh, uh, ad adjacent uh, next one. So now let us put a cyclic prefix in here. And so uh, we're putting in an extension, T EXT, and we're calling this entire value now T sub X. See, what we've done is we have extended the length by T sub X. And if we have extended the length, and remember uh, what you get when you take the Fourier transform is one over T sub X at that first zero crossing. So we, we reduced the sink uh, width, but notice what we do here. We use the same spacing as without the extension. And notice that one might easily ask this question. With the extended length reduced sink width, why not reduce the, the subcarrier spacing that you see here, thereby forming a family of extended orthogonal waveforms? Why not make these orthogonal? And the answer is orthogonality in space is not what we are striving for. We want it to be or we don't care about what's happening as it as it as it uh, wafts through the atmosphere or into s empty space. Oh, we don't want it to be orthogonal there. We want it to be orthogonal when it arrives at the receiver, and the first thing we do is remove that cyclic prefix. That's when we want it to be orthogonal. So you see, that's the reason why um, we don't simply. Uh, make it orthogonal as one over a T OFDM. Now, when you take a look at applications, LTE, long-term evolution, is a neat, I, I, what I like about this kind of an application is it immediately um, uh, puts a numerology onto uh, the uh, time slots and uh, uh, bins of uh, fr frequency uh, bins or frequency bands. And that numerology immediately starts looking like a multiple access system that we're used to. And, and that is, you know, somebody who wants service can raise his hand and say, hey, I, I need to have, you know, uh, uh, so many resource elements or uh, so many um, bands of frequency and so many blocks of time. And immediately it's got a numerology and that numerology says there's going to be a slot with seven symbols. Here they're numbered from zero to six uh, and a, uh, uh, a band here of uh, uh, subcarriers, which are 12 subcarriers. And the delta F, uh, uh, basically uh, the spacing between uh, each one is 15 uh, kilohertz. So when you're looking at what is known as a resource block, a resource block here uh, contains uh, 12 uh, sub-channels. Um, that's um, uh, 12 times 15 or 180 kilohertz times a time of a half a millisecond. That whole, that whole resource, one half a millisecond in time, uh, making, making up seven uh, symbols and 12 subcarriers making up 180 kilohertz in this application makes uh, this uh, resource block. And the resource block is made up of resource elements. And there are exactly 84, 12 times seven is 84 resource elements. And think of them as 
those things which can be assigned to uh, users as needed. And, and so, again, um, we start, uh, again, saying about LTE, uh, one frame of time uh, is made up of um, uh, 20 slots. And a slot is always a fixed amount of time, 500 microseconds or a half a millisecond. And so oftentimes they talk about a subframe, which is two slots, and uh, 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 two slots uh, is exactly one millisecond. And so you can see that these 20 slots, or call them 10 subframes here, is made up of 10 milliseconds. Now, you're going to have uh, this particular application, and this is the way applications are. They, they make themselves available uh, for certain, in this case, it's Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi at home uh, uses something like this, 802.11. Um, and you can have a seven-symbol uh, Wi-Fi system or a six-symbol Wi-Fi system. Why do you need two, uh, two times two different styles is because sometimes you're going to be in a cellular telephone type type application where you have larger cells and larger cells sort of uh, needs to have uh, larger uh, 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 cyclic prefixes and uh, and as a result uh, a longer uh, 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 symbol time. So the symbol time uh, in the uh, seven symbol case is a 71.4 microseconds. Here it's a little bit longer in the six symbol case. Again, you got longer cyclic prefixes. So again, the whole idea is you're going to be in an environment where there might be greater RMS delay spread in that environment, and therefore the cyclic prefix has to be longer. That's why you need two types. But when you get down to what is the, the data portion, the data portion, regardless of the style of the, uh, the, the bigger uh, or the smaller uh, symbols, is always going to be the same, 66 and 2 thirds microseconds. So whichever uh, slot is chosen, uh, the data portion is always the, the same so, size. And so what you're looking at here when you're using one of these applications is I've lined this up with the kind of time frequency grid that we've been looking at. And the way, the way I happen to show it uh, is I've just shown you that uh, these seven symbols is what makes up one slot one slot is what you're looking at right over here, one slot of time. And here's two slots of time and three slots of time. So, um, oh, do I have that? No, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Remember, you know, you, no, this is the symbol time over here. And, 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 and the slot, uh, the slot is is several symbols. So in this case, this represents one OFDM symbol right here. This is one OFD time symbol here. The next OFDM time symbol. The next OFDM time symbol. So you've sent off three of these uh, time symbols, and therefore this is three sevenths. What you're looking at here. What you're looking at right here is three sevenths of a seven symbol LTE slot. That's an LTE also allows from these particular modulation types, QPSK, 16 QAM, 64 QAM. And so associated with these applications, you're always going to see tables like this. I'm not going to read this table to you. I'm just going to tell you that OFDM in LTE is an application. Applications now have several types of channel, uh, in this case, channel spacings. So these channel spacings 
do have transitional guard times involved with them. And they also have the signal bandwidth, which represents uh, the modulation bandwidth that we've been talking about before. Um, and, and, and notice that for this particular application in 802.11, you always have exactly the same slot duration, 500 microseconds. The delta F is fixed. The moment you've chosen uh, any uh, time in the system, uh, it doesn't matter which one of these uh, channel types uh, you've chosen, you, you've fixed delta F uh, and it's fixed at 15 uh, kilohertz. Now, what is the sampling rate? Remember what the formula is uh, for the sampling rate. The sampling rate, I think I can, here it is. I think I can get the sampling rate is, let me give it to you. The sampling rate is the, um, is the uh, module is, uh, is 15 kilohertz times the transform size. Essentially that delta F times N, that remember that's on my laminated uh, 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 wallet uh, sheet. None of, none of these rela important relationships um, are, are missing from that little sheet. And so um, what is the size uh, so what is the, if you look at the maximum channel spacing and the maximum bandwidth application, uh, you're going to have uh, a size N, an F, uh, FFT size, or call it a DFT size, because you're not necessarily using FFT, but you probably are. Uh, 2048 is the size of the transform. And when the size of the transform is 2048, <laughs> we say, um, this, the bandwidth is, uh, not, not the bandwidth, the N sub C, the, ocu the occupied is typically about 60% of this. It's, it's a little different here, um, but not, not too much different. And, uh, and here's just a table I made, the same kind of a table. I just made it up for myself for that same uh, delta F of uh, 15 kilohertz and a T sub S, which is always 66.67 microseconds, and, and a, 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 a resource block has 180 kilohertz in it, then I uh, made the table up that includes uh, things like number of resource blocks um, uh, is equal to um, 6, 15, 25, 50, and so forth. Here, for the uh, the largest transmission bandwidth, uh, this is the hundred resource block case. Um, I'm going to skip a few and skip a few here. Here's, in fact, the way you just would line up uh, the particular uh, seven OFDM symbols with their cyclic prefix, and uh, every one of these has got 2048 samples uh, within the T sub S. Basically, remember, we got that right off the table uh, that uh, there were, um, I'm sorry, we got this right off this table. Uh, there were 2048 um, and the sample rate uh, for this particular case turned out to be 30.7 to uh, megahertz, as, as, as I've also shown on my table here. Okay. And so if you add, add all, all of these, say, the sample rate, remember, is 30.72 megahertz, <clears throat> and you multiply it by 15 kilohertz, uh, you, that verifies that aspect of it. And, and notice also, if you just add up every one of these samples that you have within this slot, within this 500 microsecond, half a millisecond slot, uh, you have exactly uh, 15,360 samples in the slot. 
that is comprised of uh, seven uh, symbols. Um, other relationships, um, I'm going to skip this for you. Also, also, using those tables, you can easily go on and find out with the things I've given you, what's the, you know, largest channel bandwidth, the transform size, candidate subcarriers, uh, using six, if you're using 64 QAM, the bits per sample is, and the slot time, what is the maximum data rate? 100 megabits per second. And if you uh, consider to, that this gets reduced by uh, throwing away, uh, by not counting the overhead, it's a peak of 96 megabits per second. Look at another way of computing it based on information I gotten from those tables, because I can do it in terms of resource blocks. You know, this same 20 megahertz, uh, which is occupied, this is the modulation bandwidth. Uh, this is the number of 100 resource blocks, which appeared on that table that I had made up. And, and remember, each resource blocks has 84 resource elements. And 100 resource blocks has this number of elements, six bits per and so on. Uh, this, these are the, for the 100 resource blocks, these are the total number of uh, bits and, and a total number of bits divided by uh, the slot time, which is a half a millisecond, gives you that same uh, peak bit rate of 100 megabits per second for this application, but throwing, uh, th reducing it by the overhead says it's 86 megabits per second. Um, so, again, reminding you about this application, um, I, it's worth showing you how it might be used by somebody who's uh, calling for service. A service provider typically responds to a wireless user's request for service. Say he requests 50 megabits per second channel based upon, and that's the way a service provider usually bases, bases what he makes his first assignment uh, uh, is based upon what the user's signal to noise ratio. That is, if the user's signal to noise ratio is large, the provider will respond with a, a small bandwidth. Like in this case, uh, the smaller bandwidth is the uh, 10 megabits uh, bandwidth. If he gives them a 10 megabits bandwidth, he did that on, on the clue that the user who asked for service did so uh, with a pretty strong signal, and therefore uh, the, the smaller uh, bandwidth might indeed um, uh, get along, uh, that, that this user might indeed have the signal-to-noise ratio necessary to get his 50 megabits uh, out of that smaller bandwidth. But notice that uh, if, if the user requested it, uh, with uh, with a uh, uh, with a smaller signal to noise ratio, uh, he'd get the feeling that well maybe he needs a little larger bandwidth, and so his first assignment might be a larger bandwidth. Uh, and again, um, uh, that having a, a smaller signal to noise ratio, uh, he would use a smaller module. See here he uses a 64 QAM because he can afford to. Uh, he has the signal to noise ratio. Here he has to use uh, a, a smaller plan because he doesn't have as much power, but because he was given uh, a larger bandwidth, he makes the same uh, 50 megabits per second service. Pictures like this we've often seen. Remember these delta Fs um, are seen here. Okay, schedule an example. Okay, one, make, one thing I want to make sure I cover, and so let's jump ahead to the single carrier OFDM. And this will be the last thing, and I'm glad we, we I hope we can get this in. What benefit of a single carrier OFDM makes it a natural for mobile systems? Single carrier OFDM offers improved peak to average power ratio, which facilitates the efficiency, the efficient operation of power amplifiers. You see, in OFDM, in, in 
in, in single carrier RFDM, what I'm able to do uh, is to, that what I, what I take is add together, uh, uh, there's a superposition of these uh, sinusoids. And, and I don't know what I'm gonna get. In ordinary RFDMA, uh, sometimes I get a very uh, pronounced strong signal. And one time, sometimes I get a, a very uh, 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 almost zero signal. And this is one of the well-known uh, properties, uh, downside properties of OFD, ordinary RFDMA is that it has a lousy peak to average uh, power because just on the basis of what, you know, data is purely random and there's no telling what the, the data might call for on adding together. So I'm saying in ordinary RFDM, the ordinary choice of here's an ordinary QPSK. And if I come along and choose them in a certain uh, fashion, you're gonna get uh, particularly large uh, nulls and peaks, that is regions that are give you uh, peaks and nulls are very undesired. And it's undesired because look at the typical efficiency for an amplifier operating with an I, the triple E802.11 A signal are on the order of 18% is a typical efficiency for such an amplifier. Thus an amplifier required to supply one watt would have a peak power capability of 16 watts and would be pulling five and a half watts from the power supply while squandering four and a half watts, raising the temperature of its heat sink while delivering one watt to its external load. This is the motivation for uh, reducing the peak to average power ratio. And so remember, uh, you know, remember what basis functions are. A common mathematical representation of a si signal is a linear combination of elementary functions called basis functions. In communication sims systems, the most popular basis functions dated sinusoid, square root, Nyquist pulses, Nyquist pulses, sync functions, raised cosine. But in OFDM, the basis functions in the time domain are gated sinusoids, and in the frequency domain, they are sync pulses. Notice what happens in single carrier OFDM. It's just the reverse. The basis functions in the time domain are sync functions, sync pulses. In the frequency domain, they are gated sinusoids. In other words, this is what we're going to wind up. In, on, in standard OFDM, every time we're looking through that superposition, you get the same um, gated sinusoids, but as, at, moment, at different moments of time, you get a different uh, value for the super, their superposition at that moment. But, and, and this is what makes for terrible peak to average uh, uh, power ratio. And this is what's gonna happen with single carrier OFDM. Individual Dirichlet basis functions are the same as saying extended sine x over x functions are transmitted sequentially, each peaking at a different time. Hence, there is a reduced peak to average power ratio because even though, you, even though you're gonna add up uh, by superposition all of the reals and all of the imaginaries, uh, they're, they're not going to add up to give you something horrible uh, on I and Q when they are staggered in this fashion. So when you look at a block diagram, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of systems showing the commonalities with single com single carrier OFDMA and those with just ordinary FDMA. This is the important difference: is that in single carrier FDMA there is this endpoint DFT uh, that uh, changes those basis functions. And this is what the picture looks like. That is. Um, you are essentially looking down this way. Let's, let's change it to looking at this way. The OFDM versus single carrier OFDM waveform formations. Numbers one, two, that is 
in OFDM, ordinary OFDM, you start off in, in looking at phasors modulating a carrier, subcarriers, and you're giving it frequency information. Sync information goes along and modulates these. Think of it as modulating subcarriers. And what comes out? Follow the arrow this way. Looking out this way comes gated sinusoids. Uh, the output waveform is a superposition of gated sinusoids. So notice what happens in, in single carrier OFDM. In single carrier OFDM, you have this added step over here, this DFT step. And this is that DFT step. It says you also start with the basis functions that look like these uh, Dirichlet extended or sync functions. But here they are time. You are entering it in uh, this axis in time. And out comes wideband. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, again, think of it as a magnitude and a phase, uh, a magnitude and a phase. And then you go into uh, this IDFT and you come out with time samples out. So, uh, or another way of saying it is, you can think of starting in here, coming out, going back in, coming back out, and 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 these are the staggered functions you get out. Let me tell you an important Fourier refresher here. When I take a look at frequency and time, you know, an impulse. Uh, for, for if, if if time was was not gated, if time was completely ongoing, there were no rectangular envelopes here. You get an impulse uh, a time forever, like DC gives you an impulse. Uh, uh, the moment you give it a, a shape like a pulse, it becomes a sync function. If you go and you take a higher frequency, not DC, it shows you two uh, impulses in frequency, uh, but it's going on forever. So you get a pure impulse. Uh, a, a higher frequencies going on forever. You just get two of these carriers with pure impulses. But now you put, uh, you turn them on, and you turn them off. So you got this rectangular envelope. So again, they take on uh, the Fourier transform uh, becomes a sync function. So now what happens when you take a look at that uh, infinite bandwidth, uh, white like white noise, uh, and, and zero phase, uh, you get an impulse. Now, immediately, it's not dot, 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 but you see I got a gated uh, wideband, that it's a magnitude over, with an envelope over it like this. It's gated with a particular uh, phase, call it zero phase. I get a sync function instead of an impulse because of that uh, envelope shape. Well, what happens if this the phase is not zero now, but it's negative T1. Well, then I got a delay uh, in this um, uh, uh, sync function, a time delay. That's why. That's why when I do this, you know, with these staggered basis functions, as I do with the uh, uh, OFDM. I'm sorry, with the single carrier OFDM. Uh, that's why I get these staggering because again. Um, when I get this wide band going through the DFT step uh, of the uh, single carrier, and I get a, a different phase slope, call it minus T2, and I get a delay by T2, a different staggered uh, uh, functions. So, and, and in the end, you know, that's the big difference. If you compare OFDM with single carrier OFDM, you know, here you're starting with staggered uh, the ordinary OFDM, you come up along with data, and what you're going into an IDFT is you are assigning frequency bins. You're making, you're taking subcarriers, you're, you're assigning frequencies, and what comes out are time, uh, 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 superposition of gated time, uh, each one taken at a different moment of time. But notice that in uh, single carrier off the end, you see, you can start with the same sort of uh, what looks like the same sort of shape, a sync shape, but notice 
they're not uh, sync functions uh, in frequency. Uh, they're sync functions in representing uh, samples in time. And going through a DFT, uh, now what you're uh, getting are wideband uh, signals. Uh, each one coming out with different phases means each one delayed uh, by a staggered amount. So again, you see the big difference is you don't get any kind of staggering here, but you get it staggering here, and you're back to uh, having your time functions here. So another thing to notice is that in ordinary OFDM, you cannot sample anything about this output to get the input data. No way. This has got to be reversed. But here, what you have is really the, the estimate of what you started out with as time samples. So the output here can really be done with just sampling, not, re, not necessarily reversing, just purely sampling it to can get it done. OK. Thank you. I, I'm glad we. I, how did we do time-wise? Uh, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks uh, right on time. So, thank you. That was great. Um, so now let's see. We do have some questions um, that, that people typed in, but um, because my system crashed, I kind of lost. Oh wait. I, now I can see them. Okay. So here's some questions for you, uh, Bernie. Uh, the first question is, is Wi-Fi a time division duplex system? And what is the timing of the TX and the RX? Um, I do not know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, an, that's a good question. Uh, I, will, um, I will look it up and get back with you. Um, and um, and the, certainly there is that 802.11, which is of course an application. The moment you say anything like 802.11, you're talking about a system application. I will uh, look up the TX RX timing. I don't know. I do not know the answer. Okay. Yes. Um, see, so yeah, there are any other questions that you see in from the Q and A? Uh, yeah, I can, I can uh, jump on here. Um, part, part of me for, um, I'm going to go from the back to the front here. So, uh, what do you do when F sub zero is less than one over T sub zero? Um, um, say, say that once again, I'm sorry, say it slowly. Uh, what do you do when F sub zero is less than one over T sub zero? Uh, when F sub zero uh, is much less than um, uh, T sub zero. One over T sub zero. One, one over T sub zero. Um, well, remember, um, we are uh, by comparing uh, F sub zero uh, with one over uh, T sub zero, you're really comparing apples and you're asking for apples and oranges because remember that F sub zero, um, when when we did have, when we when we showed you the slides last week, having to do particularly with the channel, particularly of what we learned in 1963, having nothing to do with OFDM parameters, but just the channel that might be given to us. Then F sub zero was the part that we called fading profile. It was the coherence uh, bandwidth. And the coherence bandwidth is the fading profile. And when you compare it uh, to uh, one over T sub zero, which is basically uh, the Doppler rate, uh, you're looking, remember, you're looking at one column called uh, fading profile in the channel um, 
um, uh, information. We, we, we showed you that Proacus uh, uh, diagram out of his book, and you're looking at the, the left-hand uh, column, uh, which is fading rapidity, having to do with how fast you're going. And so, uh, you know, it is true that the channel, um, and, and I, I make this as a point, that uh, the, the, only, the only place that I guess, you know, the channel of uh, fading rapidity is purely a channel is when uh, the movement that we're talking about is not the movement of the user, but let's say the movement of the uh, atmosphere or the uh, movement of, uh, of uh, weather uh, like rain, uh, you know, then it's purely uh, the channel that you've been handed. But when I, when you're in a moving vehicle, uh, then you, the user of this channel, are influencing what the channel looks like. Because uh, when you're moving faster, when you're driving faster, uh, you're, you're the, the fading rapidity, uh, not the fading profile, but the fading rapidity is changing. So when you ask me the question, what happens if F sub zero, uh, the coherence bandwidth, which is a fading profile, which will tell me something about you know, uh, how I'm going to be able, well, when I compare it to my actual signal, uh, how am I uh, going to compare uh, to that profile? Uh, if you're asking me to compare it uh, to the reciprocal of uh, the, the coherence time, uh, which is a, a fading rapidity number, and of course, let me immediately put on the slide of the things uh, that I, guess I, I, I told you it was, um, uh, this is what, yeah. Remember this slide that I put on? I put on a slide that I wanted. I, that I said, this is what I want to have laminated for my wallet. And that all of these, uh, based upon all of the numbers that you might have in, in representing the blocks that go on in this um, uh, 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 um, fantastic OFDM uh, uh, frequency time <laughs> relationships, the, the time uh, 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 parameters that are, uh, can be called out, the frequency or the rate or the bandwidth parameters that can be called out. And in addition to that, I said, look, I also have to put something down about the channel. Now, now if you take a look at just these bottom ones right over here, Let's let me right, these bottom ones right here, including this coherence time, which is you know approximately one over the Doppler uh, fading, uh, having to do with some motion. And again, you see that T sub zero has is related. That's a channel uh, uh, quality, a characteristic. You don't on the on a on the one hand even think that the channel you're being handed has anything to do with you, the user. That's, you know, that's the channel, and that's the way it usually is. That's the way it is with all of these things. All of these things uh, have, have, have nothing to do with you, the, the user. They all have to do with the channel. I put them in because uh, they're called for in the use of OFDM. But, you know, notice how a T sub zero is a little, it is a little different. I'm calling it out in two ways. One in terms of the Doppler, because who knows, maybe it's the uh, atmosphere that's causing uh, channel changing. Uh, but in, in this case, you see that you and a vehicle, uh, again, uh, are, are guilty of modifying uh, the rate at which that profile uh, is changing. So there, there is a, when you ask the question, uh, if F sub zero is much smaller than one over T sub zero, um, uh, there is, uh, it's apples and oranges. They don't compare. You're asking about a fading profile and how fast is the, is the profile changing? You're not asking about how, how fast is the signal changing, but how fast is the profile changing? See, you... If you ask, if you ask about F sub zero, the coherence bandwidth, 
and something to do with OFDM, you got to relate it to the OFDM signaling, not not the uh, channel, you uh, uh, know, not the uh, uh, channel profile, uh, not the channel rate of change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah oh, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad we uh, we we stopped on this slide. Think about this slide. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm not kidding. Laminate it for your wallet. If I if I go into any OFDM uh, system, this is the piece of paper I would take with me. This is absolutely the piece of paper that I want to make sure I haven't forgotten a thing. Uh, I'd want to make sure all all the nuts and bolts, uh, uh, because look, OFDM in some sense is like a great big jigsaw puzzle, making it all work neatly because there's a lot of technology there. And, and this is a piece of paper to make sure you're not gonna miss, miss any one of them. Every one of these numbers have, has, has better comply. You know, you better have a, a number for it. It mm -hmm. better either be given or fall out of the design. And of course, the channel parameters are, are what you're fighting uh, and that is related to what you're interested in. So I call, I call this a useful, I call this piece of paper a useful tool, a useful design tool. And 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 please remember, if you've got my email, please uh, do not be, uh, I, I, I love hearing from uh, uh, people who attended these talks and want to you know uh, questions. I'll be glad to ask you uh, personally, so please do that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scalar, again, an outstanding speaker and author. Um, I think at this time, I'd like to maybe see if we can unmute uh, Moman. I think he has a question, and look, but he also wants to make an announcement. Okay. So can you do that, Darren? Yeah, Moman, you should be able to come online now. Hi, uh, hi this is Moman Kudus. I'm the uh, current chair of the One Aventura section. So I wanted to make an announcement. Um, I triple E One Aventura section. Uh, uh, last year was awarded uh, a grant by the IEEE Foundation to uh, develop a program on sustainable engineering, climate change, and wildfires. So uh, we will be having you know, a series of 15 talks over the year, and I, uh, I'm, well, uh, I'm inviting all of you to join. So those of you who are part of I triple E uh, Buenaventura section, you will get the announcements via the newsletter. And those of you who are outside this area, uh, I invite you to look at our, uh, our website and the announcements will be there so you can join. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that moment. Yeah, it sounds like a very exciting series of talks. Um, so, I think, um, I think this pretty much concludes our meeting for tonight. We're coming up to 8.30 and uh, thank you all for uh, staying with us um, for this two-part talk. And definitely in the future, the opportunity would like to invite Dr. Skolar come back and talk to us some more about uh, all DM or other topics. So, thank you again. I wish I could uh, give you um, you know, you can hear our applause, but uh, thank you, thank you, Victor. Thank you for asking me. Okay. All right, and uh, I think that's it. We'll be signing off. It's at eight thirty. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.